Welcome everyone to uh, today or this month's session of uh, CCNA, CCNP Q&A. And uh, I'll be the one taking your questions today. Uh, in the event that you haven't ever seen one of my presentations before, or if you need to reach out to me after this session is done, there you have my contact information. I'll go ahead and make that full size there for you. My name is Keith Bogart. Uh, I'm an instructor here at INE. Been with INE for about four years, specializing in their CCNA and CCNP routing and switching curriculum. And you can see there, there's my email, my Twitter account, and my LinkedIn account. Um, so let me preface this by saying that you know, I'm going to take as many of your questions, we have a one hour window today, so I'm going to take as many of your questions as I can within that one hour time frame. Depending on how many questions there are, I may or may not be able to get to all of them. I know there's about five billion people watching at the moment. Well, maybe only one billion people watching. But if you ask a question that doesn't get answered, we don't have time to it. First of all, I would recommend that you actually place your question on INE's online community because that way other people can benefit by seeing your question and the answer. Now you might be wondering, what is the INE community? Well, let me show you where that is and how to get to it because um, a great place to share the knowledge. You don't have to have purchased any INE products or anything to participate in this. So, but you do need an INE account, which is free, absolutely free. Uh, so probably the easiest way to get to it would be to go to uh, just INE.com. And then, and by the way, just in case you haven't seen this, we do have a pretty good promotion on right now. So if you're thinking about, uh, now if you're watching this, I'm assuming you're interested in CCNA and CCNP stuff, but if you're actually pursuing a CCIE or you know of someone who's pursuing a CCIE and they want to take a live boot camp to sort of round out their knowledge, we've got a great promotion going on right now for people who want to take one of our CCIE boot camps or we have a brand new Google boot camp as well. I don't know anything about that, but either one of those will get you some good deals here. But what I want to show you is if you scroll down to the very bottom of our site, um, notice, let me make this a little bit larger here, right here in the lower left-hand corner where it says IEOC forums. So you want to click on that. Now, um, I think you can read stuff from the forum even if you're not a member because notice right now I'm not even signed in. So you can read stuff, but if you actually want to post a question, if you have a question and we don't get to it today, you definitely want to sign in. And then you would probably want to post your question under you know, whichever one is relevant, if it was CCNA or CCNP, just depending on what your question was related to. But post your questions here. And there's a lot of people that monitor these. Almost guaranteed within 24 hours, you will get an answer to your question. But on the rare occasion when a question is posted here and a couple, two, three days goes by and nobody answers that question, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. And like I said, there's my email, LinkedIn, and Twitter information, and I'll do my best to, to get back to you, okay? So today, I don't really have any set agenda. I have one hour with you guys, and like it said, this is a Q&A session, so this is your opportunity to ask me any questions you have about the CCNA routing and switching certification or the CCNP routing and switching certification, and I will do my best to answer your questions. Uh, we also have a lot of other people watching as well, so in the event that you ask something I don't know, I'm sure somebody else here will also be able to chime in and give their advice as well. So with that being the case, let's just go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, let me scroll up here and just see what questions we can start with. There were some towards the top. Okay, uh, so I'll start with Siraj. Siraj, you asked a question from where do I start? Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that your question is, how do I start pursuing a CCNA? What's, what's the first thing that I do? And I'm assuming it's CCNA that you're referring to. So with both, with all Cisco certification exams, the very first place I would recommend that you start is by opening up the blueprint for the particular exam so you know what topics you're going to be tested on. In the event that you don't know where the blueprint is, I'll show that to you. Uh, just start out with your good friend Google. 
okay? And let's just say it's uh, CCNA. So just type in Cisco CCNA. And you're definitely going to want to look for the website that is a Cisco website. So these first ones, plural site, training camp, we don't, we don't care about that. Uh, so we want to go down here to where it says CCNA routing and switching because that's a Cisco website. Click on that. All right, and scroll down. Now you'll see that with the CCNA, you have a choice of taking two separate exams, the ICND-1 and the ICND-2, or taking the composite or accelerated exam. My advice for the vast majority of you would be to take the two separate exams. The composite exam is, or the accelerated exam as they call it, is really designed for someone who's already been in the networking industry for at least six months and has already started working on it and has some of a baseline knowledge of it. So let's say you want to start with the two exams. You'd start with the ICND-1, so just click on that. And the blueprint is where it has, says right here, review the exam topics. So every single certification has a section under description that says review the exam topics. That'll get you to the blueprint. If I click on that. So this is your first starting point. Uh, this shows you the general categories that you'll be tested on. And if you click on show details for any one of them, then it shows you more specifics of the technologies that you have to learn. So I would, I would recommend printing that out. You can see here that you can download that in PDF format. So I would print that out. And then step number two is you need to go and find this technology and study it. And this sort of brings me to Arjun. Arjun, sort of this is a segue into your question because Arjun, you had asked, how can I do a CCNA course uh, because I can't afford the money? All right. I understand, you know, all the stuff all, you know, that, that we have here at INE that uh, other companies have is for sale, right? And I recommend, and I know that some of you guys out there, you just can't afford it. I understand that, right? Everybody comes from different financial backgrounds. My general feel is that once you've got the blueprint here, and you can see the blueprint is free, as long as you have an internet connection, you can get to it. As long as you have an internet connection, you've got the blueprint in your hands, you can study for the CCNA. Technically, you don't need to follow any particular vendor's course. So you could just go down this list here and say, okay, well, compare and contrast the OSI and TCP IP models. You don't know what the OSI model is. Great, no problem. Just go to Google and type in. And I would preface everything with CCNA. Like, I wouldn't just type in OSI model. You'll get a lot of stuff. I would type in CCNA OSI model, okay? Or if one of the bullet points says EIGRP, I would say CCNA EIGRP. And the reason I recommend that is because some of these topics, like EIGRP, like a lot of them, if you just type in the name of the topic in Google, you might get a document that goes way beyond what you would need to know for the CCNA, something that like would get you all the way up to CCIE level. And you don't want to do that, right? I mean, it's good knowledge, but you, right now you want to focus on CCNA level knowledge. That's why I would preface everything with the word CCNA when you're searching on it. So there's a lot of stuff for free online that you can search and you can just do your, your studies this way. You don't need to pay for a course. Um, but of course, there, there are definite benefits to, to purchasing a course from some vendor. Number one, um, the assumption is what you're getting in that course is finely tuned for CCNA. And what I mean by that is, even if you type in CCNA EIGRP online, you don't necessarily know if you're getting everything that you need to know about that topic to pass the exam. You don't know if potentially you're getting more than you need to know to pass the exam on that topic, right? But when you purchase someone's videos or you know someone's um, whatever, some, some formatted course, the assumption is what you're getting there is finely crafted to fit within the realm or the scope of what you would need for the CCNA. All right, so that's, that's one of the benefits of purchasing an actual course is that it's designed to give you what you need to know for the exam. The other thing is a, more, a, a course is more structured, right? Um, as you're going through those bullet points in that blueprint, some of those bullet points you would not want to study until you've learned other bullet points be ahead of them. For example, you know, in, in the list of items, it might put something like IP addressing way down like three quarters down on the list and it might put above that access lists or routing protocols or something. Well, 
I'll tell you, if you're just trying to study the blueprints one at a time, and you're trying to study access lists or routing before you get to IP addressing, you're going to be totally confused. Because in reality, you need to know IP addressing in order to have the foundational knowledge to understand access lists and routing protocols. So once again, that's another benefit of using a structured video course or some other course is that it will be given to you and taught to you in an order and sequence that actually builds one topic on another and goes in a logical manner. The blueprints, those aren't in any logical manner. That's not recommending you should study this and then this and then this and this. It's just giving you bullet points of topics. All right, so I've, I've said enough on that. So let's see uh, what other questions we have here. Uh, crypto, crypto tool on the INE site, not sure where to purchase individual courses. Please advise if possible. Yeah, I can show you that real fast. That's real easy. I uh, just go to INE.com and you can just uh, click on the shopping cart. So actually, let me zoom in here on this. So here's INE.com. I'll make that a little bit bigger for you. There we go. And the upper right corner, you've got the shopping cart. You can just click on that. It says your car is empty. That's fine, but now click on continue browsing. And then from here is where you would find all the stuff that you can get, right? So if you're thinking about, for example, uh, Cisco, and you wanted to do, maybe we're doing CCNP stuff, so professional level. All right, and here's all the individual courses you can get related to CCNP, whether it be service provider or routing and switching. So this is how you would get to the, the individual things and, you know, if you don't see something in here, for example, if you say, hey, I'm really interested in, um, in MPLS and I don't see a course on that, just call up our sales staff. They, they can always do incredible things. They might be able to create, you know, a, a bundle specially for you. So if you don't see something in here, don't give up. Just contact one of our sales staff and I'm sure they can work something out for you. All right. What other questions do we have here? Let's see. Okay, so Alami, you're, you're asking a question. You say, uh, with five hours of study, how long would it take for CCNP routing and switching? So I'm assuming that you're talking about five hours a day of studying because you're certainly not going to be able to learn what you need to learn in just a single block of five hours. So. All right, let's say the, that you could devote five hours a day to it. This is also a really subjective thing because a lot of it depends on how well you can memorize things. I mean, you know, I can read 150 pages of a certification guidebook in five hours, but at the end of that five hours, how much have I retained, right? How much do I memorize? Um, because these tests are testing your memorization skills is really what they're doing as computer-based exams. So. I'm just going to throw out sort of a loose number here or a loose duration. If you are studying, now the CCNP is three switch, uh, three tests, three tests. Uh, the first two you can take in any order. The first two are route and switch. And I usually recommend that people take the switch exam first only because if you take a look at the blueprints, the blueprint for switch is about one third the size of the blueprint for route. The blueprint for route has just so many more topics in it. So there's less things you have to memorize, less things you have to learn to pass switch. But if you want to start with route, go ahead and start with route. And then the third exam is called T-shoot. Definitely want to save that for last. Okay, so you can do route or switch, whichever one you want to start with, followed by T-shoot. All right, so let's say you're starting out going for your first exam. Let's say switch and you've got five hours a day that you can study every single day. Um, well, if you're creating flashcards, if you're testing yourself frequently, doing a lot of practice exams, if you're also doing a lot of labs during that time to reinforce your knowledge of the command line, and you're doing that five hours a day every day, I would say you could probably, you'd probably be ready to pass a switch exam within a couple of months. 
I mean, five, five hours a day is a lot of time. So I would say within two months, you should be ready to sit for your switch exam. And then if you repeat that schedule, I would probably double it for route. I'd probably say another four months of study, maybe three, three to four months of study and labs and testing, and then you could sit for route. And then the nice thing about the T-Shoot exam is T-Shoot does not require you to know any additional topics. Um, T-Shoot is literally just testing your ability to troubleshoot the things you've already learned in route and switch. So if you've passed route and you've passed switch, I mean, literally, I think you could sit for the T-Shoot exam the very next week after you pass your second exam. There's really no need to study and necessarily prepare for T-Shoot. Now, one thing I will show you, though, um, and I'm very proud of this. I created a T-Shoot workbook here at i &E, and I think it was fun. It was just fun putting this thing together. I love making labs for people, especially labs which are sort of break-fix labs. So let me show this to you uh, so that when you do get to T-Shoot, it's just an additional tool in your tool belt you could use for, uh, for troubleshooting. I'm for troubleshooting, for practicing. So if you go to, let's see here, um, members, dot ine dot com. Now, once again, you'll need a, the, the free login to get in here, right? Just supply your name and email address. Oh man, this thing didn't cache my information. Hold on a second. Let me use Chrome. Uh, Chrome has cached my stuff. Let's see. All right, bring this over here. Okay, so when you log into the member's account, um, now you, I'm, when I click on workbooks, I'm going to see a lot of workbooks because, you know, I'm an INE employee. When you click on workbooks, you're only going to see workbooks that you've already purchased. Um, so I'm just going to show you what the T-Shoot workbook looks like, but you'd have to buy it to actually see it. So let me make this a little bit bigger. So here under workbooks, CCNP T-Shoot workbook. It's composed of a whole bunch of tickets. You can see you've got 20 tickets in here. And if I just click, for example, on ticket number one, when you're doing a particular ticket, you're not going to know if this ticket is related to route or switch related topics. You don't know. Just like when you take the T-Shoot, right? When you take the T-Shoot, you've got about 20 or 25 tickets to go through in a two-hour window. And every single ticket, you're not going to know what technology you have to troubleshoot. But the topology I've created here in this workbook, I tried to as closely as possible match the actual T-Shoot topology. The actual T-Shoot topology is publicly accessible. Um, you can search for it on Google. It's not proprietary. And it looks almost exactly like this. I actually use the exact same IP subnets, um, the exact same VLANs. And uh, when it gets to IPv6, there's some tickets in here for IPv6. I, so after going through these 20 tickets, you should already have memorized a lot of what the actual T-Shoot topology looks like. So that's going to speed things up for you when you're troubleshooting. And the way these tickets work, these tickets go hand in hand with our INE rack rental. So you have to rent some time on our CCNA, CCNP rack. And once you get on the rack, you say, okay, I'm going to do ticket number one. So if I scroll in here, you'll notice it says in ticket number one, load the T-Shoot ticket one initial configuration. Okay, so you would log into the rack and then you would download that pre-config. And when you download the pre-config, it will pre-configure this whole topology for you and there's going to be something broken in it. And just like the real T-Shoot exam, the real T-Shoot exam, each ticket is composed of three multiple choice questions. The first multiple choice question in a ticket is where you have to identify on which device did you find the problem. So like right here, on which device was the problem located? So you'd have to select that. Then once you do that, the second multiple choice question within that same ticket, just like this, is the problem was related to which technology? And you can see here, here it gives you the answer for the first one. So you have to select, you know, what technology was the problem related to? Now I'm not going to, I'm not going to expand that. I've already shown you too much as it is with ticket number one. Now here is where my T-Shoot workbook differs from the actual T-Shoot certification test. So if you're on a ticket in the T-Shoot test and you've answered what 
device the problem is on, what technology it's related to. The third question you're going to be given, which is also multiple choice, is it will show you a listing of commands, iOS commands, and it will say, which command would you type to fix the problem? So it's sort of like you know, you're working for the TAC, right? the Cisco Technical Assistance Center. You're on the phone with a customer. You don't actually have access to their equipment. You can't touch it, but through talking to them, you find out you know, what, de what device the problem is on. Through them sending you configs and things like that, you discover what the problem is, and then you have to tell them what commands to type in to fix the problem. Now, in my workbook, I take it one step further. I actually want you to fix the problem. So step number three is, what did you do to fix the problem? And then once you think you've got that, you click to expand, and I'm not going to do that here, but it'll actually show you. This is what the problem was. These are the steps you would have taken to fix it. And then you go on to the next ticket. Preload its configuration, and it will have something broken, and you'll go through the exact same thing. So that's, uh, that's one way to prepare for, for T-Shoot. All right, so I got a little off track there. Uh, let's see what other questions have popped up in the meantime. Okay, um, so Roshan, you're asking EIGRP stuck and active. So I guess you're trying to ask me what is an EIGRP stuck and active. We don't have a lot of questions right now, so that gives me time to answer yours. So with that, let me just real briefly talk about what an EIGRP stuck and active is. Let's get rid of that. And let's see here. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to bring up a blank slide to draw on. Jimmy Christmas. All right. New slide. Here we go. All right, let's just draw, let's just pull this over here. My whiteboarding tool is being a little finicky right now, so I have to improvise. Okay, so with stuck and active, here's the basic idea. Uh, you have a router, router one, router two, router three. All right, router one is connected to some network. Let's say it's network X. Okay, so from router one's perspective, he is the successor to network X because he is the best route, the best path to get to that network. Now, router one has an EIGRP neighbor relationship with router two. Let's say this interface right here goes down. He's lost his connectivity to network X. In EIGRP, first thing EIGRP does is he goes in the topology table and he says, okay, has anybody else ever advertised network X to me? Maybe they weren't quite a good enough route, so they were a feasible successor. If the answer is yes, I will promote that route. I'll promote that route to being the successor and I'll just start using that. Well, in this case, that's not going to be happen. He's going to say, hmm, nobody else has ever advertised network X to me but me. I was directly connected to it. So here, router one says, okay, the successor is gone, which was me in this case. I have no backups, no feasible successors. Hmm, but I do have some neighbors. So he will send a special type of an EIGRP packet called a query. And he'll say, hey, neighbor, do you know about network X? Now, when he sends that query, there is a timer. So right now, network X is in what's called the active state because he is actively trying to recover it. He's trying to find it again through somebody else. Now, a route in the uh, an entry in the EIGRP topology table cannot stay active forever. Right? In, in a normal circumstance, when this query gets to a router 2, we would get a reply back from router 2 within like less than a second. It would be like that, so fast. But sometimes there are circumstances that happen where we don't get that reply back very quickly. And we don't want this route to stay in the active state forever. So there's actually a timer called the active timer. And by default, it's a pretty conservative value. It is three minutes. 
and you can get a packet around the world like dozens of times in three minutes. So we're saying, okay, neighbor, you need to send a reply back to my query within three minutes. If for some reason your neighbor does not send a reply back to that query, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe the query never got to him, right? Maybe router 2's interface is corrupted or congested, or maybe router 2's CPU is at like at 99% and he just couldn't process it. For whatever reason, he can't send the reply back because he didn't get the query. Or he got the query, he sent the reply back, but router 1 could not process the reply, right? Maybe on this interface right here, when the reply came in, there wasn't enough buffer space for it, Maybe router one CPU is like really, really high, but for whatever reason, this one, two process didn't work. He never got a reply back. So after three minutes, router one will say, okay, this neighbor, router two, is stuck and active. And what that means is now we tear down our neighbor relationship. We say, goodbye, router two. I don't trust you anymore. Any routes that I learned from router two are wiped away, and then I have to build my neighbor relationship all over again. So that's what stuck and active is. You, you, this three minute grace period expired and you did not get a reply back from your neighbor. All right, so hopefully that helped. Okay, let me see what other questions we've got going on here. Oh, a lot more stuff has popped in, great. Um, okay, Alami, I already answered your question about five hours of study. Anton, uh, very good question. Hello, about the CCNA, how can I practice for the routing and switching simulation labs that will be in the exam? Okay, uh, so obviously you need to do labs in order to be able to be prepared for the simulation labs in the exam. Absolutely. It's like, you know, a couple of days ago I did a CCNA kickoff show and in that show I used the analogy that, hey, you know, if I was uh, preparing for a multiple choice test in French, right, I, I'm trying to learn the French language and they're going to be testing me on that in a multiple choice format. Well, technically, could I pass that exam without ever speaking a word of French? Yeah, I probably could. But does that actually mean I know French and I can use it and I can speak it? Absolutely not. I have to speak it in order to actually be proficient with it. So the same thing is true with Cisco iOS commands. While you might be able to memorize commands by looking at charts and tables and reading books, if you don't actually get on routers and switches and practice hands-on, uh, it's going to be bad for you, uh, especially if you have to troubleshoot something. So that begs the question, okay, well, how do I do labs on this stuff? So first of all, you have to decide for yourself. There's two approaches here. There are labs you create yourself, and I'm, I'm particularly fond of this, where when I'm reading through something, for example, I was reading through the uh, CCNA certification guide, and I got to the section on uh, AAA and AAA servers, which is a server that's running a special software for security, for authenticating users. And it talked about how to do that, and it gave some examples of that. I thought, okay. I like to try that out myself. So I logged, to, I logged on to uh, INE's CCIE security racks and I built a small little topology out of that and I practiced using the AAA server. I looked at the drop down buttons. I, I tried to replicate what was in the book there. I made a couple of changes and see what that happened. So that's an example of you creating a lab yourself. You have an objective in your head that you want to accomplish. Best thing is to write that out on paper first uh, so you're not wasting time with the rack rentals and then build it and try it out. Or the other approach is some people like a more structured approach with their labs. They would prefer to like have a lab workbook in front of them, like the t like the T-shoot workbook I just showed you, where it actually has defined objectives already stated out based on a defined topology, and it already shows you what the answers are and what you should be seeing based on that lab. So that's number one. You have to decide for yourself which approach you want to take. Then number two, after you decided that, at the CCNA level, I would recommend using Packet Tracer. Uh, Packet Tracer is a free tool you can, you can download. Just go to Google and type in Cisco Packet Tracer. Uh, you'll have to enroll in the Cisco Network Academy, but it's not like you have to attend any classes or anything. You just give them your name and email address, that's it. 
And then you can download Packet Tracer, and then from Packet Tracer, like I said, at the CCNA level, you can pretty much create any lab that you want within there and just play around with it and become more proficient with the iOS commands. Certainly, you can rent time on our racks as well. And some of the benefits of renting time on racks, whether it be INE racks or anybody else's racks, is it's real equipment. You see, when you're using Packet Tracer, it's a simulator. It's not real Cisco iOS software. And what that means is, for example, there are some commands you need to know for the CCNA that aren't available in Packet Tracer. They're just not in there. There's some features and protocols you need to be able to work with that aren't in Packet Tracer. You can't do it. Now, I would say that probably 90% of the commands you need to know and the features you need for the CCNA are available in Packet Tracer at the CCNA level. If you're really concerned about that last 10%, that's where you would need real equipment. That's where you need to log on to INE's rack rentals or somebody else's rack rentals and actually practice on real routers and switches that have the real Cisco iOS software. Uh, but you'll want to do that. That's how you, you should go about that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so uh, Brolic or Brolic, you say, what is the approach for the CCMP route and will there be an update to it? I've already taken switch, but I've been studying each topics in depth. All right, um, as far as an update, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, there's probably within the next year, I would expect there to be one. Uh, Cisco typically updates their exams every three to four years. And the last time the, the CCMP exams were updated was, I think, back in January of 2015. So we're already into the three-year mark. So, you know, I don't have any inside Cisco people that talk to me about this stuff. So um, I searched the forms and everything. And right now, Cisco has not publicly posted that they're going to be doing an update. But it would not surprise me at all if they're in the process of doing an update right now. So I fully expect within the next 9 to 12 months for there to be a, uh, an advertisement about the CCMP updating their exams. So I expect that to happen. Now, as far as the approach to study for the CCMP route, well, if you already took the switch exam, I would say use the exact same approach you used on the switch exam, right? Um, uh, if you use the official certification guidebooks for switch, Get yourself the official certification guidebook for route and go through that. Um, if you used a bunch of flashcards when you're doing switch, create a bunch of flashcards for route and do labs, labs, labs. You definitely want to um, really emphasize labs for route. Uh, Salim, you're asking, is it mandatory or helpful to go with practice exams before ICND2? Uh, I would say it is absolutely helpful for any of these, these what they call written, they're really computer-based, but written exams, CCNA, CCNP, all the way up to the CCIE written. You want to prepare in advance by getting your hands on as many practice exams as you possibly can and do those practice exams over and over and over again. I would say that you should not register and sign up to take any exam until you've gone through at least three or four minimum practice exams and you can do those practice exams and repeatedly get like 85 or 90 percent correct every single time. Uh, until you're reaching that mark with confidence, I would not sign up for the actual real exam and take that. Um, is So Julio, you say, is there an expanded blueprint for the CCNP exam, similar to INE's CCIE Route Switch V5 expanded blueprint. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, the only blueprints I've ever seen are the ones I just, just showed you. Well, I, I showed you the, uh, the CCNA blueprint. But on Cisco's website, that is the most comprehensive blueprint I've seen. Now, certainly people who have taken the exams may have created their own blueprints going in more depth. Uh, but there is no official expanded blueprint that I have seen. If anybody else has seen one, I would love to know it. Mohammed, you ask, how much deeper do we have to learn a specific topic on the blueprint for CCNA up to CCIE? 
And can you give your comments on CCIE data center or service provider or security for nowadays? Um, for that last part, I would love you guys to chime in. Uh, for those of you guys who are watching, if you have any comments on the valuation of data center versus service provider versus security and, and what you've seen in the field, I think this would be a great opportunity for us to give Mohammed our collective experience with that. I can definitely speak to the first point there. So from, let's just take a topic, for example, like a routing protocol. Um, let's take BGP as an example. So at the CCNA level, you have to know like this much of BGP, just scratching the surface of BGP. Now at the CCNP level, <laughs> this is where it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a challenge because if you look at the CCNP blueprint, let's go ahead and just look at that real quickly here while we're talking about BGP. So Cisco CCNP route, all right, 300-101 route, exam topics. All right, layer three technologies is we're going to find our BGP stuff. Now, if we scroll down through here, um, okay, so right here, let me expand this for you so you can see a little bit better. So looking at the blueprint, it looks like there's a pretty good jump between CCNA and CCNP when it comes to BGP. All this stuff here is BGP. And even though it takes up just basically three major bullet points, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, for example, just this last one, bullet point 3.32, explain BGP attributes and best path selection. Well, there's a lot of BGP attributes. There's a lot of them out there. Um, and the best path selection process is kind of complicated. So if you were studying off of this blueprint, I would say that from the CCNA to the CCMP, there's a very large jump just in this topic alone. Unfortunately, <laughs> and I don't know why they do this, when you actually take the route exam, you're going to see very, very few questions on BGP. And I know that from personal experience as well as from experience from students who have attended my classes. I've had a lot of students come to class and one of their complaints is that, hey, I took the CCMP route exam and I saw like one question on BGP or I saw no questions on BGP which is shocking to me because if you look at the blueprint, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn uh, for BGP. But I can verify that you will not see a lot of stuff about BGP on there. But then when you go from the CCMP to CCIE, BGP would probably triple what you see right here or even quadruple. So there's, there is a large jump between the NP topics and the IE topics. But probably what's one of the most difficult things is that at the IE level, you're now going to have to learn things for the very first time. For example, there's a lot of features and protocols that you never even touch at the CCNA and CCMP level for routing and switching. For example, you don't touch multicast. You don't learn anything about multicast until you get to the CCIE level. And that is a huge topic, multicast, just in and of itself quality of service. You kind of scratch quality of service with the CCNP, but then it's way massive at the CCIE level. So jumping from NA to NP, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a doable amount, right? Any topic that you see in the NA, you'll have to learn a little bit more about that at the NP. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. But then that same topic in the IE, you'll have to learn a whole lot about it, and you'll have to learn all new, entirely new topics you never even knew existed before at the IE level. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Uh, how long is a CCNA certificate valid? I believe a CCNA certificate is valid for three years. I know that CCI CCIE is good for two years. Let's see. Actually, let's just go back to where we were. Nope, not that. If I can't find this out in 30 seconds or less, we'll move on. Cisco CCNA. 
How long is CCNA valid? All right. Uh, three years. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it's good for three years. Um, Banishri, I'm looking at your question. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I think you're asking about the recertification process and how by taking one test does it help recertify lower tests, but I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there. So if you could rephrase that, that would help. All right, Abhishek below answered that question anyway. So thank you, Abhishek. Abhishek typed in the answer to the recertification process. Um, Georgie, on your CCNP route videos, how do you do the IPv4 to hex conversion in your head? It's just really, just, it's just practice. It's just doing hex over and over and over again. Um, I can just tell you that the quick sort of how I go through it just real fast if this will help you. So if I'm given a number in decimal like 201, for example, I know that in hexadecimal, I know the first three placeholders very, very well in, he in hexadecimal. I know this is the ones position. I know this is the 16s position. Oh, I guess it would help if I shared that. And I know that this next one is the 256s position. All right, so looking at that, I quickly ask myself, do I need any 256s? No, this is less than 256. Don't worry about that. 16s, how many 16s go into 201? So I just think to myself, okay, well, 16 times 10 is 160. Um, and then if I have 16, 16 is 32. So 160 plus 32 would be 192. All right, so that'd be 12. All right, so and 12 in hex is C. All right, so let me just, 160, that's 192 right there, right? That was 16 times 10 plus 16 times 2. That gave me 12, and 12 is C. And now I've got, what, 9 left over, which is just 9. So 0, C, 9. So I just, just real quickly in my head, sort of do the division and multiplication of 16s and 1s into whatever number I'm looking at. All right, what else do we have here? Uh, okay, uh, Eduardo asked a very good question about, uh, he saw the EIGRP video, didn't understand how the function of the router ID works, how does it work, and what is the function of using the router ID? All right, so real quickly, um, OSPF, BGP, and EIGRP. They all create router IDs and they all do it in the exact same way. Uh, so the first thing that the device looks for is, is there a loopback? If the answer is yes, if there's more than one loopback, it'll pull the highest IP address from all the loopbacks that you've got. If there's just one, it'll pull that. If the answer is no, then it's the highest IP from any interface that is not admin down. So even an interface that's in the down, down state does qualify. So if there's not a loopback, it'll look at all the physical interfaces. And of all the physical interfaces that are not administratively shut down, it'll pick the highest IP address from those and use that as its router ID. Now, what does it use the router ID for? Now, you specifically asked about EIGRP. Uh, the main thing the router ID is used for in EIGRP is for EIGRP external routes. So if I had two routers right here, let's say three routers, and let's say I um, create a loopback on this guy, and I gave him one, 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 and I create a loopback on this guy, and I accidentally gave him the exact same IP address. Well, then that means that router X and router Y, 
are, are now going to have the exact same router ID. If I go into router X, and let's see router X is learning some uh, RIP routes or OSPF routes, and he's redistributing those into EIGRP. Well, when he does that, he's going to put his router ID on there. And when those routes get to router Y, router Y is not going to accept them. He's going to say, uh, these routes did not originate from me, and yet they say I originated them because the originating router ID is 1111. So it's kind of like a safety or security check um, with EIGRP external routes. I don't think, and let me just check this real quickly here, I don't think EIGRP internal routes really use the uh, router ID. I'm just going to look at the EIGRP packet format real quickly here. Images, and let's see here. Okay, so, so for example, here in this picture, I'll zoom in on this. This is our EIGRP packet format. Uh, so nothing here in the normal EIGRP header has any mention of the router ID. And let's see, what we want is, yeah, and this is an EIGRP internal packet, an EIGRP internal route, right? And I don't see any mention of a router ID here either. So there's no way to detect a duplicate router ID when you're exchanging EIGRP internal routes. Uh, it's only used as a security check or something for EIGRP external routes. Other than that, I don't know of any other use of the EIGRP router ID for anything. There might be some other sort of corner case uses for it, but I'm not aware of anything else. All right. Um, let me do this. Um, you guys are awesome. You're asking a lot of really good questions. And there's still several questions I haven't gotten to. Um, I'm going to right now, just for the next few minutes, because we are sort of running out of time, we've got about a little less than 15 minutes left. I'm going to scroll through the questions, and for now, I'm going to ignore the more technical questions about, you know, what does a router ID mean? Can I do subnetting? And I want to just scan through here to see if there's more questions related to practicing for the exam, how do I take the exam, and, and if I run out of those, then I'll go back to the more technical questions. But I, I want to hit those. Uh, let's see here. How many questions at most can I get wrong and still pass the ICND-1 exam? So Juan asked that question. Good question. Um, it's really impossible to say because the, the exam is based on 1,000 points. 1,000 points is a perfect score. And you have to get at least 810 points correct to pass the exam. The problem is, it's not a one for one correlation. It's not like one question equals one point. It's, you don't know. When you're taking the exam, a question might be valued at five points, it might be valued at three points, it might be valued at 12 points. You have no idea. It's all in the background of the exam. So, you know, one could certainly guess that the simulation questions are probably have more points weighted towards those than the multiple choice questions. So you probably take a bigger hit if you fail the simulations. But honestly, it's really impossible to say how many you can miss and still get the thing right because you don't know what the spread of points is for any given question. Uh, let's see here. Rajiv, I wish I had an answer for you. Um, Rajiv says, I've taken my CCIE written and I'm now planning for the lab. The irony is, now Pearson View is taking some 18% tax on the exam fee, which is a huge, which is huge for the lab exam. You're right, the lab exam is very expensive. Is there any way to get rid of that? I, this is the first I've heard of that. I did not know that they did that. That seems kind of wrong to me. Um, so if anybody on here has heard of that tax and knows a way of a way around it, myself and Rajiv would be very interested in knowing that. OK. 
Okay. And Christopher, uh, just to answer your question there, you said, how do you study for the CCNA? Um, real short answer, number one, print out the blueprints. So let's just say we're dealing with the ICMD-1 exam. Print out the blueprint for the ICMD-1 exam. Then I would suggest you get a hold of the Cisco Press official certification guidebook for ICMD-1. Either actually buy it from like Amazon or something. I think it's like $27 or get a subscription to Safari Online Books where you'll have access to thousands of books. Now that you have that book in your hand, um, and of course I'm going to plug our videos too, right? We have an ICMD-1 video series, so this is the way I would go about it, is I would read the chapter in the book. As you're reading the chapter in the book, have some blank 3x5 note cards sitting on the desk next to you and start making flashcards. So anytime there's anything in that book that you think, hey, this is something they might test me on, uh, especially numbers and values, like, hey, here's an IP address used by this protocol. Here's a TCP or UDP port number. Here's a timer for something, three seconds, 15 seconds. All of that stuff, Cisco loves to test you on those little trivial details. So start building up your flashcards, write your question, write your answer as you're going through the book. Now, after you finish like chapter one in the book, ideally you'd have the ICMD1 videos at your disposal. Look for the videos that go along or correspond with chapter one and watch the videos. And you might get some ideas of other things you can create on your flashcards. Go back to those flashcards every time. At the beginning of your study session, test yourself with your flashcards. At the end of your study session, test yourself with your flashcards. Now, at the very beginning, a lot of the stuff you're going to read is just going to be theoretical or conceptual in nature, not really stuff you can practice. But once you get into chapters like three, four, five, then you'll start learning some things you can actually do. So at that point, I'd recommend as you're reading something, it starts talking about, oh, here's a protocol and here's how you configure it. Here's how you make it work. What I like to do is I have a piece of paper next to me as I'm reading something, I'm thinking about, okay, what equipment do I have access to? All right, so let's say I was thinking about INE's racks. I know that on the CCNA racks, I have access to four routers and three switches. I know that's the topology. So as I'm reading something in a book that is utilizing routers and switches, I may think, okay, What's the minimum quantity of equipment I could use in my rack to practice this technology? Like I might be reading about in the book how two routers learn about each other, form a relationship with each other, and start exchanging routes. Well, in order to do that in the lab, I only need two routers. I don't need 20 routers to do that. So I would draw on my piece of paper, I'd draw two routers, put a line between them, and as I'm reading about it, it might say, oh, for these two routers to talk, they need to share the same um, subnet. So I'd write on my piece of paper, okay, here I'm going to use the subnet 10.11 and I'll put some IP addresses on my paper right there. Okay, they also need to share the same authentication. So I'd write on my piece of paper, authentication, and maybe beneath that, password equals, make something up, test, right? And so once I'm done reading that section, I've now created a little lab for myself on a piece of paper. I know what I want to accomplish. Maybe I'll put some bullet points on there. What happens when IP address is wrong? Question mark. What happens when authentication password is mismatched? Question mark. So I'll put some things on that paper about what I want to test that I know is going to be wrong so I can see what's going to happen on my equipment when I try that out. And then, now that I'm done with that section in that chapter, put the book on hold, try it out. Get into Packet Tracer, get into our racks or whatever, and build that and try to make it happen. And then, go back. Reading, flashcards, watching videos, doing it in the lab, and just repeat that cycle. Also, practice exams, right? One nice thing about the Cisco official certification guidebooks is at the beginning of every single chapter, they have a do I know this already quiz, which is anywhere from like eight to 15 questions. So what I typically do is I will actually put that book on a copy machine and, and print out those exams, those multiple choice questions. I'll do like three or four copies of them and then in addition to doing my flashcards like once every three or four days, I'll go back to those practice exam questions and do that in like pencil. And on INE, of course, on our website too, we have an ICND-1 and an ICND-2 practice exam that's available as well. Uh, so you can practice that. So that's the method I would take. All right, let's see here.
And uh, Guru, you ask, in which order should I study for the CCMP route? Videos, book, lab, or some other order? I like to start out with books first and then use videos to reinforce what I read in the book. But that's just me. Some people actually prefer to go the other way, start with videos and then read about it. It's your own personal preference. Uh, but you definitely want lab to be the last part of that order. You have to read it, watch it, think about it, understand it before you try it out. Primary, pr primary method for CCMP T-shoot exam preparation. Um, I showed you guys our INE T-shoot workbook. Um, and I think that's a really good way because that you can download labs that are already broken and you get a chance to fix them. And it, the workbook shows you what the problem was and how you fix it. So that's, that's one of the best ways. Uh, secondarily to that, sort of behind that would be as you're creating your own labs, intentionally break things. You, you want to get exposed to what messages you're going to see, what debugs look like when things are broken. So, you know, think to yourself, like, whenever I'm reading something that says, this needs to match or this needs to happen in order for this to work, I'm always thinking to myself, well, what happens if I don't do that? What if I create a lab and I intentionally break that rule? What am I going to see? So that's another good way of doing it is don't just create labs based off the books and try to make it work. Try to make it break. Try to break it and see what does it look like when you break it. Uh, but ideally, you'll get a hold of some labs that somebody created like our workbook or somewhere else where you can download a topology that already has broken configs in it and you can try to find the, the solution to that. All right, what else here? What's the price for the CCIE lab? Oh, yeah, let's take a look at that. It's been a while since I've looked at it. I think it's something like $1,500 or $2,000. Cisco CCIE R&S lab. CCIE routing and switching lab exam. Here we go. All right, lab cost. Lab exam cost does not, okay, yeah, well, tell me how much it costs. 1,600 US dollars, 1,600 US dollars. And with all of these things, the lab, the, ex the written exams, the computer-based exams, if you fail them and you need to retake it, they don't give you a discount, all right? So don't go in there thinking, oh, well, when I take it a second time, I'll get a discount because I'm taking it the second time. Nope, you're gonna pay full retail price no matter how many times you have to retake the lab exam or any of these other tests too. So just be aware of that. Uh, so, Mohammed, I think I already answered your question. How do you prepare yourself by reading Wendell Odom's CCNA book? Just like I said, create a lot of flashcards. Pause as you're reading, create flashcards, and test yourself frequently with those flashcards. Another thing, um, a lot of times in the books, they'll give like graphics. Uh, let me see if I can just do like a sort of simulate graphic. Like you might see a graphic that looks like this. It might be a chart. It'll look like this, some sort of chart. And here it'll give you some sort of iOS command. And then here it'll give you a description of the command. Okay. Um, or it might, it might be a chart on, you know, here's the order that you would do things. And say, okay, here and, and why do you do that? What I do is, once again, I copy that page, I print it out, and then I cut this up. I cut it up into, you know, in this case, eight little squares. On the back of each square, like on the back of these, I would put one, one, two, two. Three, three. And then I'd scramble them all up and I'd put them on my desk and I'd, I'd reorder them. I'd say, okay, uh, which, which one do I think is number one? I think this command is number one. Which description do I think goes with it? Oh, I think this one goes with it. And then try to replicate this and put it back together again. Uh, so that's another useful way that you can use these charts and things that they have inside the books. I'm sorry, I didn't even show. I had my whole face on there the whole time. Um, I was just showing you this, right? And a lot of times you'll have charts like this inside the official certification guidebooks. And you'll have something here like an iOS command and then a description of why you're using it. And what I said was, you know, just 
copy this, print it out, uh, cut this up into individual little squares on the back of each square, put a number, you know, tying them together, and then just try to put the, you know, just scramble it all up and then just try to reassemble it in the correct order, try to recreate the graphic um, as it was in the book. So that's another way you can use these things. All right, we have a couple more minutes here. Let's see here. What's the best, so Shiran asks, what is the best simulation for switching practice and advanced BGP and MPLS? All right, I'll handle the BGP and MPLS first. So anything that you can do on a router, I would say GNS3. Um, I know that Cisco has Cisco's viral solution out there and the one thing I don't like about viral, well, there's two things. Number one, you have to pay for it, which isn't a huge deal. It's not tremendously expensive, uh, but there is a yearly subscription fee for it, okay? The second thing I, I really don't like about it is the last time I looked at it, it was horribly complicated to get going. Just the things you have to install, the, the things you have to tweak in your computer to get the thing running. It was like, man, I don't want to waste all this time. I just want to do some stinking labs. So it just seemed to me just really complex just to get to the point where I could do the labs that I want to do. Now I'm sure after you've done it for a while, it becomes second nature, but I'm kind of impatient. I just didn't want to wait for that. GNS3, if you've never used that before, it's a free tool. Um, so you can go to, for example, if I go to here, you can just type gns3.com and you can download GNS3. Now the one thing about GNS3 is GNS3 works hand in hand with Cisco IOS. So you have to have a real Cisco IOS image that will be partnered up with GNS3. So how you get that image is up to you and there's only certain images that will work in GNS3. Uh, but you can search on here like in the documentation stuff about which images will work. I personally use the, the 3725 images, uh, the 3725 router images. And the great thing about GNS3 is you're actually importing real Cisco IOS into this software tool. And now you can build your own topologies right on your laptop. You don't even need to have internet access, right? Cisco's viral requires internet access. It's another thing I don't like about it. GNS3, you can do it anywhere, even if you have no internet connection whatsoever. And so anything that a router can do, you can pretty much do in GNS3. So certainly anything with BGP, anything with MPLS, you could do in GNS3. Now, as far as switching is concerned, unfortunately, to do a lot of the switching stuff, especially some of the more advanced switching things like DHCP snooping and private VLANs and things like that, you really do need to get a hold of a real switch. And for that, I would recommend INES rack rentals. You probably don't want to go out and buy like three or four physical switches. I mean, you could, but for just $100, you could get 33 hours of rack rental time on our CCNA and CCMP racks, and that gives you access to three physical switches and four physical routers. Um, and you really do need access to physical switches in order to do a lot of the switching things. Okay, so. I'll answer a few more questions here. We're a little bit over time, but we'll take a few more questions and then uh, I'll let you guys go. What method do I use to master? So Lamchadi asks, what method do I use to master a technology? Um, I, I start out with the books, the official certification guide books. And like I said, as I read through it, I create a ton of flashcards for myself. I go through a lot of the quizzes. I, I copy things in the book, print them out and go over it multiple times. Um, I have also found that one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. So ideally, for example, let's say you were studying for the CCNA and you know, ideally you would be part of some sort of a study group, like a real live study group. And the best way to teach something or learn something is say, Hey everybody, um, next week when we come back, I'm going to give you all a, a 15 minute presentation on spanning tree. Now you're into the hot seat. Now you have to study Spanning Tree. You have to create slides on it. 
And as you're studying, you're starting to think, okay, what questions might other people ask me? I better learn it so I can answer those questions. And by being under that stress and pressure of having to prepare something to teach to others, you will learn it really, really well. So that's, that's another good way of, of learning something. Uh, Shubham says, recently I did CCNA routing and switching. What should I go for next? CCNA security or CCNP routing and switching or any other CCNA based certification? This is purely my own opinion, okay? So take that for what it's worth. But in my opinion, m virtually everything sort of rests on the foundation of routing and switching. Collaboration, security, data center, all of those require that you have a real good foundational knowledge of routing and switching so you can start branching off into those specialties. And while the CCNA is good, personally, I really think you need the CCNP routing and switching level before you're ready to start branching off into security or collaboration or any of those other things. I think if you just had a CCNA routing and switching then you branched off into wireless or security or something, I think you'd still be lacking in some of that routing and switching foundation. So my personal opinion is if you've got your CCNA, go up one more and get your route switch and T-shoot, get your CCNP routing and switching under your belt. And then if you want to branch off into one of those specialties, that would be a good time to do it. All right, I'll answer two more questions. Um, this won't count. I, uh, one of the last questions is, what do I think about Eve Next Generation versus GNS3? I, I, don't, have any, I don't have any experience with, uh, with Eve, so I can't speak to that. All right, Draco, great question. Do you recommend that we use IPv6 when practicing in the labs using dual IP or just IPv4 is IPv6 used a lot in companies and within governments? Okay, short answer, yes, you want to learn IPv6. Why? Because it's on the exams. And it's increasingly becoming a bigger and bigger element of the exams. For example, when I took the CCMP route exam, I was surprised at how much IPv6 was on there. As a matter of fact, I think there was almost more IPv6 routing questions than there was IPv4 routing questions. So. You know, here in the United States, IPv6 is growing. Um, it's still far from being predominant. So in real networks, you're not going to see it a whole lot just yet. But your goal here is to pass the tests, right? And the tests are heavily emphasizing IPv6 um, from the CCNA all the way on up. So absolutely, when you're doing your labs, you want to get familiar with your IPv4 and your IPv6 commands and get familiar with some of the differences between how the protocols work between IPv4 and IPv6. Absolutely, you want that. I'm going to do one more question. Let's see. Just looking through here. All right, so let's see here. What are some of the ones here from the bottom? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer this last question from uh, Tech Lovers here. So Tech Lovers writes, when a router has a VLAN or bridge, I'm sort of paraphrasing, VLAN or bridge connected to the interface. In this situation, how can I calculate the broadcast and collision domains? Okay, so for that, I will show you. So here I have my router, here I have my interface. Regardless of what's connected here, this interface, oops, I guess I need to share that, All right? So here's my router. This interface right here is the end of the broadcast domain. 
And why do we say that? Because when a router receives a broadcast, the only question it asks itself is, is this broadcast for me? Do I need to process it? But he will not forward that broadcast. So the broadcast ends at the router. If it's for him, he'll look at it, he'll process it. If it's not for him, he'll throw it away. But once that broadcast packet comes in, it will never go out any other interfaces. So that's why we say the router's interface is at the edge of the broadcast domain. Now, if on that router's interface, we have connected here either a bridge or a switch, doesn't matter. Um, so now we have to ask ourselves, okay, what VLAN is this interface in right here? All right, so this interface on this switch or bridge, let's just say switch for now, is gonna be in some VLAN. Let's say it's VLAN eight. All right, then in order to figure out how big the broadcast domain is, you have to ask yourself, what other interfaces are in VLAN eight? Maybe all these interfaces are in VLAN eight. And do they extend out to other switches? So all the switches that are interconnected here, whatever VLAN this is in, you have to ask yourself, how far does it extend from this switch to the next switch to the next switch? That is your broadcast domain. Because with switches, unlike a router, when a broadcast comes in on a switch's interface, the switch is not going to kill that broadcast. The, the, the router does. The switch does not. The switch takes a look at the, at the uh, so let me just do it like this. Here's my switch. When a broadcast comes in, the main question the switch asks itself is, what VLAN is this port a part of? Let's say it was VLAN 8, and he's got other ports here. Maybe this is also in VLAN 8, this is VLAN 5, this is in VLAN 22, and this is in VLAN 8. Well, if that broadcast came in on VLAN 8, the switch will flood it, keep it going, on other ports, they're also in VLAN 8. So a switch does not terminate broadcast domains, it, uh, it facilitates or it expands broadcast domains. So hopefully that answered that question. All right, so with that, my friends, we have run out of time. You had some great questions this session. I hope this session was really useful to you and beneficial. Um, I appreciate your questions. They're really good, really insightful, and I hope it uh, helps you on your journey into your CCN, CCNA or CCNP. So with that, I will bid you adieu. I will wish you a, a good weekend and um, good luck on your tests, and hopefully I'll see you in one of my CCNA or CCNP boot camps coming up soon. I've got a CCNA boot camp coming up in two weeks. Hopefully I'll see some of you guys there. All right. Have a good night, everybody.